Zo, mijn microfoon staat al aan. Thank you very much. So, how was that for you? Awesome, eh? You can applaud if you like. I would like to check the audience. What are your first impressions by the documentary? Who would like to share something? Don't be shy. JC, I see you smiling at me. <laughs> I'll come to you. What was your first impression? Um, well, another friend of mine, he advised me to go here and he actually said that it made him cry and it also made me cry. Ah, I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. Michael, what was your first impression? Well, very similar, that it's very moving. And um, yeah, recently I've seen some more uh, 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 documentaries about women visiting their origin, countries of origin and looking into their family heritage. Somebody sitting over here. <laughs> She's turning around, <laughs> Ellen Rose. Uh, she was in one of her, the documentaries about Suriname and slavery. And uh, it, this reminded me in some ways also very much of that documentary, uh, women looking into their family heritage, other strong women who survived. So very empowering. Very empowering, isn't it? Is there anybody on this side who would like to share something? I know Monir always likes to share something. Hi, Monir. <laughs> Hi. Um, well, I start to realize more and more how we reduce people to an ethnicity where they are somehow really rooted in, but not attached to. And I was saying to Sam here, like, I'm so Egyptian compared to, to this thing in a sense that I grew more and more into Egypt. I visit my Count, I call it my country, listen to me. Uh, I, it is your country. It is, both, it is. I visited like four or five times a year. I bought a house last year. My father never built a house in Egypt, I did. And so for me to see this woman, Hadisha, that didn't visit her family for 20 years, for me, it's, it's, I'm like, wow, I'm more first generation than second or third, but I am, I'm second. So for me, it's very interesting to look into myself and realize how Arabic, like how Arabized I became during the years. And I think this is an, an, a movement that we maybe share, many people of bicultural origin, that we go back to our roots and embrace it and realize that we have much more there than we thought we did. Ah, I recognize that. Thank you very much. I see you nodding. You were nodding, and you were nodding so kindly that I think, oh, I'm going to walk over to you, sir. Uh, <laughs> You're really sweet, aren't you? That's what he told me. Um, yes, I'm uh, Shannon. I, I lived in Morocco for a, a year, and, uh, uh, and I live in America now. Um, uh, I'm black and Filipino by, uh, you know, by my heritage. Uh, living in Morocco, I, I felt, always felt welcome, and, uh, and that's the first time I had ever been... Uh, been around people that look like me for the most part. And I, and I think in America it's very important, very important that we see Muslim women uh, challenging, uh, challenging the norms and, and speaking out for themselves. Because in America we think, uh, well, the, the picture is that Muslims don't do this. How necessary are women like Khadisha and Mama Alel? Oh, uh, very important. Um, even when I was in Morocco, you, you would see women challenging, and uh, I'm sorry, I'm nervous. <laughs> no, no, don't be nervous. We're really kind, aren't we? Yes, we're all friends and family here. But I, but I think it's beautiful that and it's an important message that uh, to look at our ethnicity when we're in uh, when we're in America, when we uh, travel. I'm a first generation American, and for my mother, and uh, looking at my black roots, looking at my Filipino roots, and her looking at her her roots, her ethnic roots, and her. Uh, uh, her roots uh, and how it speaks to the world and about Muslim women, about uh, Amazigh women, you know, I think is very important. And about you know, even um, uh, women, uh, Dutch women, and uh, <laughs> with different ethnic backgrounds. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm running out of words. No, no, no. I like your words. Thank you very much for your contribution. So we will go on with the panel conversation. I won't break my neck wearing these heels, but I love them so much. <laughs> I need to wear them. I would like to call on stage Ibtisim from Amsterdam United. Welcome, welcome.
and Fatima from the Moroccan Association for Women in the Netherlands. Hi. Can you speak in the mic, please? Yes, yes. Hi, how are you? I'm good. good. You're good. Yeah. Could you tell me something about Amsterdam United? Um, Amsterdam United is a student platform at the University of Amsterdam. And um, um, like this movie, we try to fight for equality and uh, justice within the university. So you can think of decolonizing curricula or um, we have a mentor program where we, academic diversity lab, where we focus on students from um, either first generation or with a migration background um, to help them with kind of stumbling blocks they might come across. And how university. important is such a documentary for Amsterdam United? Um, very, like, I'd, I'd like to start first with how important it is for me. It's a yes. very personal That was my second question. Yeah. <laughs> you can go first. You can go first. Um, it's a very personal documentary for me, and I recognize a lot of what people were saying in the audience as well. Um, but for me, it just it resonates so much. And I, like, one of your questions before this was also, like, what appealed to you the most? Like, there's nothing that doesn't appeal to me. It is the love for a country where you weren't born, but you have so much connection to it anyway. And because of your parents and the culture and the tradition, while at the same time being frustrated with so many things there. Yes, we, right we will here. discuss that later. Yeah. A big so win. that's, and I think for Amsterdam United as well, um, it just, we try to give other stories and not just one single-sided story. And I think what this movie does is create awareness, which is how it connects to us. And wow. Our so it was 100% recognizable for you because mm. your family is also from the same area, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, so you recognize everything. Yeah, even the pictures and like yeah. the cabs and yeah. Oh, nice. Well, yeah. thank you so much for sharing. Fatima, yeah. welcome. Thank you. It works. Yes. Could, you <laughs> could you tell me something about the Moroccan Association for Women in the Netherlands? Yes, uh, MVVN, Moroccan Women's Association Netherlands, um, was an, founded in the 80s when it was still beautiful in the Netherlands and leftist and secular and um, migrant welcoming. And um, it was mo one of the first um, self-organizations of migrant women, Moroccan migrant I women. I heard that in the 80s, people were like, immigrants were actually welcomed. Yeah. Like, like a red carpet almost. <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't say that. I mean, they came here for uh, working. So they were welcomed by the uh, Fefe Day, et cetera. Yes, oh, <laughs> Fefe Day, ah, now you say. <laughs> um, and uh, basically what the MPVN has done over the past 36 years is um, always, well, it's a, the, the goal is very simple, it's just to enhance the social position of Moroccan women, but because in the Netherlands, because they are both Moroccan and Dutch, they always have two law systems that uh, basically reign over uh, their lives, specifically when it comes to matters of family law. Yes. And uh, the problems that um, arise from those contradictions is what we are fixated on and we try to system, uh, like systemically and structurally um, uh, change things for the better. Okay, so it has to do with a lot with law and for women as well. Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Do you recognize a lot in the documentary? Um, or, yeah, of course. Of course, name one. Um, oh, I mean, you recognize the people, you recognize the country. Um, the story is totally different for me, and in the sense that I, I have never had a big period of time that I wasn't in Morocco. Like, so I was sort of. So grown. it's quite different. She hasn't yeah. been to Morocco for over twenty years yeah. due to all the proposals. Like a lot of women were, yay! I'm so popular. And Khadija, like, no, <laughs> stay away. So you have uh, you have been a regular. So it's how important is such a documentary? What I like about the documentary, what how what, why I think it's so important is um, it, it tells the story of it's, it tells a very complex story about one just one person and her uh, context, her family, her relation to different countries, and yes. that's just one story which is already which tells so many stories. And then if we would do a movie about Ibti Samir, it would be totally different. Uh, and maybe the same in a little, in some other So aspects. there would be similarities, but also a lot of differences. Exactly, because we are, you know, yeah, and that, complex. That, yes, so we're not stereotypes, 
we're not caricatures, but we're individuals with our own stories. Yeah. Okay. I would like to welcome on stage the Grande Dame, Le Voyage de Kadisha, Kadisha Al Murabit. Okay. Kadisha. Thank you. You're a philosopher. Yes. You're connected to both the Free University and the University of Amsterdam. You're a fighter for equality everywhere. And I love your vulnerability in this documentary. You saw my vulnerability? In yes, the several times. Oh, okay. Did we not see those tears, people? <laughs> yes, we did. Well, yeah, indeed, because I think... Um, in a way, strength means that you can show vulnerability. That is strength. Yeah. Not hiding behind a mask or pretending. I mean, we all have emotions. We all have sadness or happiness. And uh, I mean, we, I don't, I like authenticity and showing um, that which is real, which is in the moment there. So we actually also didn't have a script for the movie, so that's why you see certain things happening uh, that are very spontaneous and not planned. Oh, I like that's, it a lot. Yeah. I love that's it a also lot. Yes, kind of a vulnerability to make a documentary and just go out there and sometimes just see what will happen, who you'll meet, and how and how important was it for you to go back to your roots? How important was it for your identity? Well, I think you, you are a mosaic of identities and uh, you can tell yourself that you are in a certain place and that you are living there, but when you have, and there is this very wise professor I know from the University of Amsterdam called uh, Francio Guadalupe, who said that uh, we are not a diaspora, we are actually a metaspora, meaning this, this mosaic of identities, um, it creates the whole of us. So when there is this part of you, which uh, your roots are in a certain country and you receive it from your parents. Because to be honest, I mean, my parents also told me a lot about um, where we came from. And there's a lot of pain and scars in there also because of the colonial history, because of the migration history, etc. A lot of people so, don't know about the colonial history in Morocco. Yeah, there's a very big colonial history. Yeah. Very big. A yes. lot. A lot. <laughs> the French and the Spanish uh, have... Uh, have a, we have a shared history, let me, let me say it in that way. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's, it's important to, to like, try to find out all these aspects, all these bits and parts of your identity. Because I don't believe that, for example, when you have the discussion here in the Netherlands about choosing one certain passport. Like, uh, for Moroccans, you cannot even choose to leave your Moroccan passport because you are always a Moroccan. You are born, you are Moroccan. You cannot say, I don't want my Moroccan passport anymore. I used to find that um, a bit oppressive, but now I'm happy because now I'm like, okay, you know what? So I have them both. And it doesn't mean that I am not loyal to, the, to my Dutch uh, uh, passport. Or, I mean, if you can be loyal to a passport. Yeah. <laughs> you're loyal. That's the question. Yeah. You're loyal where your family is, where your life is. That's where I'm, I'm loyal where I am safe, where my family is safe, where the people I love are safe. That's where I'm loyal to. Oh, thank so, you. So, yeah. Yeah. So I think that's why it's important. Ibtisim, do you recognize what she said? It is really important to look for your roots. Um, yeah. I just, it's also because when you talk about an identity and... People have always asked me, do you feel more Moroccan or do you feel more Dutch? And I used to answer this, I'm going to be honest, I used to answer this, I feel more Dutch because I was born and raised here. I speak the language a bit better. Um, but it's still like you always kind of know it's not your full identity and that I really recognize the whole mosaic. Was it a idea. mask to fit in society? Was it, sorry? Was it a mask to fit in society? Um, not necessarily, like not deliberately a mask. It's just, I guess, yeah. Yeah, a bit. It's just like you, you try to like put it away. You try to put away things that are not making you fit in with the norm. And I started to realize that more and more as I got older and went to university and got in touch with people who had similar backgrounds. And it just, I guess so, yeah. Definitely yeah. when I was younger, yeah. Fatima, because you say I go back a lot to Morocco, is this important for you? For your own identity and for your roots? Yes. Oh, I need to share. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, it's okay. 
Um, yeah, give it to her. <laughs> Thank you, Max. Can I take it home with me? Is it yes. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Uh, I have, well, what Khadija just said, uh, she has fam I have family too in Morocco. My grandparents are there, my uncles, cousins, people. Um, so so it's, it's very clear in your identity. That's what I get from your story. Is that correct? It's, there's no, it's not a question of, it's a question of relationships. I have family there, so I go there to see them. I have to maintain yeah. that relationship um, because I want to. I mean, I miss them, and so that's why I go back regularly. And my parent, that's why my parents went back regularly for vacation, and I went with them. Okay. And so, and that's why I always like, um, in that sense, let's say my Moroccan Moroccan identity. So. No, not Moroccan Dutch identity, but Moroccan Moroccan. I grew has a sort of uh, grew with Morocco, in well as a still like as an as an outsider. But I have like a continuous development uh, that was basically was mirrored with the Moroccan development because lots of things have happened there, which I have seen. Yeah, there's a whole development. There's yeah. a whole history there. Yeah. So, so when I was like little, 15, 16 years old, I went to the Caribbean, Trinidad, Tobago, and there was like a lot of guys like, ps, ps, hey, ps, 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 and all eyes, and I was really young. And when I look at your documentary, you say like it's really different than in Holland, because when I'm over there, I feel all these, I feel like a male gaze. All these men are looking at me and checking me out. How was that for you? Is it for me? Or yes, for you. Well, first of all, of course, like um, um, harassment is everywhere in the world. It's not only solely in Morocco, but depending on where you are, it can differ. Even in Morocco, it can differ. When I'm in Rabat, there is also harassment on the streets, but it can differ from, for example, from Nador, or if you go into a rural area, for example. Yes. Um, why do I explain this? Just to make it clear that this is not something Moroccan. Because I always have to do this while uh, giving an answer. I have to try to, to unwind these uh, stereotypes, try to unwind these misconceptions yes. about it. So yeah, it is uh, a very male-dominated... Um, uh, there's a difference between like this, the life in the streets and the life inside. So there are places when you are on the streets, you will get more of these male gazes, you will get more harassment because the public sphere is seen as a male uh, place. Yes. So that yes, is... I, I noticed um, when we're talking about the patriarchy of the patriarchic system, it's not that we hate men, but <laughs> it's not, um, we would no? like... No. I mean, <laughs> no. What? <laughs> is this, this is new. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, it's like we want equality between f uh, male and female. And like the patriotic system puts men up there uh, in salary, in status, in power, in everything. And when we like battle the patriotic system, that's what we do. We want equality. And, and can I just add yes. to that that... This is something that I also, because the, the documentary is shown in Morocco in different places, it's been on the national Moroccan TV. And just to make clear that, that like toxic masculinity, not masculinity is not the issue, but toxic masculinity is also yes. a problem for men because you have to abide by certain gender expectations. So even, it's, a, it's an issue for everyone. That's what I always try yeah, to... Yeah, it's not an issue just for women but also for men. I saw that when you were sitting with all the women and they said, well, we cry because we are women. And then you said, but men cry too. And for men not being able to cry or being aware that they can have emotions is also toxic for them. That's what you're trying to say, right? Yeah, I'm just trying to, to unwind this idea that... Um, that you're a real man if you don't show your emotions, or you're a real man if you, I mean, what, yeah, that's, that's what I also try to do, because it's, it's so, there are so many layers in it. Um, I had this discussion once in Madrid where we had the a projection, and uh, there was this, this um, lady, and bless her, she said that I should have called it by its name. And I said to her, well, sometimes in a documentary you don't say things 
exactly as they are. You just show them. Yes. And people will recognize or will... You don't have to name everything. No. And But when would you have named it? I'm just wondering, like, what did she... Well, she wanted me to say the word uh, that it's uh, toxic masculinity, it's patriarchy, etc., etc. I'm like, yeah, well, if you make a documentary, you can do that, but <laughs> I would rather like show it and you know because there are so very different ideas about it like the Moroccan identity being Moroccan like being a human being is very complex yes. it's not being this or that so you have also these very different ideas about um, gender about a lot of things like for me I am also here from the Netherlands so I have also this Eurocentric way of looking and that's something I have to be aware of because there are also women organizations in Morocco that are already doing a lot against uh, inequality, against gender stereotypes, etc, etc. Yeah, it's very pro progressive. We had this discussion before and you said when I go to Morocco, Morocco and they're discussing racism and sexism, it's, it's very progressive but in Netherlands we never show that. So that also brings a sort of stereotype about the Moroccan community. And that makes people suffer. That's why a documentary like this is really important, like our friend said over there. <laughs> What I loved, loved, loved about the documentary was the were the family relationships. They were so warm and filled with humor and and strength, and it's like, oh, adopt me now, please. <laughs> What do you think? Yeah, Fatima's like, yeah, I want to say something. Yeah, say something. Well, I mean, of course, that's <laughs> that, that's the strength. Because um, she had those discussions also with her family, with her uncle, for example, that she yes. loved very dearly. And that's what I, I mean, that's the best way to have a discussion with someone you love and then hug them afterwards. Yes. And that's, Show I them think, respect, but also challenge their mind, exactly. but show them respect. And see how he changes while he's speaking. Yeah. <laughs> I really, really liked that scene as well. But also, what really got to me as well was when you saw your grandmother for the first time in 20 years, was it? Yeah. I mean, that was, that was so emotional for me. And I bet that was when you cried as well. Because that was just such an emotional moment. And I recognize that as well, because the last time I went to Morocco was two years ago. But before that, it was 10 years. And then you don't think you miss it or there's nothing. But like then you go there and you see there's something missing. And especially the family relations are so important. Just you, really yeah, I like, you were talking about a female group in India called the Gulabi Gang. And it's, it's like, if you don't know it, it's like Pink Saris, Gulabi Gang, and there's a group of uh, women in India. And they're like all for empowering and talking and whatever. But when you like harass a woman and you beat her, they will beat you down with sticks. And you like them, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> If, if I was living in India, I would surely go and be part of that group. And they don't they just go and beat men who, who like beat their, their wife. Or they, they also fight for, um, like there, there was this uh, village where, the, I think it's a village or a small town, and they had to pay a lot of money to the energy company. But yeah. it was too much. So these women went to this energy company and they demanded that they that they would uh, do an investigation why, why the bill was so high and people had to pay too much money. And the, in the end, they corrected it. So yeah. they do a lot more than just beat men up. But yes, I know. They fight for Jesse like yeah. Mama Allah. Yeah. You, see, you see some recognition between your grandmother yeah, and what I think, they do? Um, Like, uh, you, they, they, these women, they just stood up, you know, to have the strength to just say no to the world that is trying to put you in this kind of mold and demand from you that you act in a certain way and not, not be a strong woman, not speak out too loud, uh, you know, go, stay in line. I think that's... Yeah, be shy, uh, yeah. bow your head. Humble, always yeah, make room for others. Not say the wife's name, say my children are calling, when it's your wife calling, stuff yeah. like that. And, and I think that's something that I, I, can, I can look up to these women, the Gulabi gang. I think it's very empowering to see them um, fight for um, justice and... Yeah. Fatima and Ibtisim, do you know some, some strong female characters that you look up to in your family? I, I start? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely, for sure. I think most of the women in my family are an example, but 
especially relating it to this documentary, I can really relate to both of my grandmothers, but especially uh, my grandmother here, who at a later age uh, divorced from her husband, which is like, shuma as fuck, but that's what, you know, like it's, it's, it's not, not done. done. Not it's done. not done. Um, and I think the strength she showed, some, for some people just existing is already brave enough. And I just want to emphasize that. It's cool that some people can fight and physically fight, but for some people just surviving is enough. Wow. And I think yeah. that's very important to also recognize as well. Um, and I see that in many people and women also in my family. I so love I that you say that. For some people, existing is enough. Yeah. Getting through the day. Thank you so yeah. much for that. Yeah. Fatima. Um, well, what, what, what I like, I have two grandmothers. One, well, I've, one uh, died a long time ago, but I yeah. still have some memories of her, but like very vague. And then the other one, uh, she has dementia now for some several years. So, And I was a little too young when she got it. it well, to you, like under 20, and then, after, you know, that's not the age when you ask no, personal questions. not important so, questions. So both grandmothers are sort of a mystery to me. Uh, at, at the same time, I know like a lot of things about them. Um, and what I know is that they have both had horrible lives in, uh, because like they had to work really hard just to survive, like really hard, unimaginable hard. And at the same time, they stayed um, very, they were very respected, so they stayed um, they, like with their own personality. Um, they didn't. They were authentic. They were true to themselves. True to themselves, yes. And then there's especially the my mother's mother. She um, so besides, like what she's a role model also because she has what she did was um, uh, she had like um, what is it called? There was like a local women's market. Yeah. And she had a tent there. So she was one of the main women that sold all kinds of stuff. And apparently she was so good and she was so fast and so whatever that she was a very, she was a great businesswoman in her own way. Um, and I find it's a tradition in Morocco that has now disappeared completely, yeah. but I still remember it. Actually, I went as a small girl when I was around six years old yes. on a donkey down to the women's market and I stayed with her and... She got me candy, it's all I remember. Wow, <laughs> candy! We love your grandmother already! <laughs> yeah, that was just the idea of like, uh, so working on the land, working in a business market, working at home, having 13 children in the meantime. Wow. And, um, still standing, like, still standing. literally wow. still Strong standing. Strong woman! Yeah. Strong, wow. Um, I have to share a story about a journalist called Weird Duck, and he did. Um, yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and he did an interview with Hindustani Suriname woman like myself. I didn't. I wasn't interviewed by him, but it was about sexual abuse in uh, in the in the community in the culture. And after that, he spoke out against a multicultural society. He said we failed as a multicultural society, and he misused those stories to prove it. So, and I felt as a woman, you're stuck. Because you can't really like criticize your own culture or your own family because you will betray them somehow. But also, um, you give like food to racists. You kind of feel stuck sometimes. How is this for you, yeah. Khadija? Uh, well, yeah, it's recognizable. I think you mean that you always have to be aware of a certain gaze regarding to. The criticism you have of your culture, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, I had this question also in Madrid uh, from uh, a Moroccan man who wrote an article about it, which I dislike. <laughs> <laughs> and he said that, aren't you afraid that you are helping Islamophobes by, with this documentary? Well, my answer to that was that the problem with someone who wants to use something of yours or something that you are trying to talk about or an issue that you want to talk about because it is, in, in, it, it is unjust, 
um, they will always find something to use. They will, they will always find something to beat you up with. Yeah. Like an Islamophobe, and I actually dislike the word, it's actually somebody who just is an Islam hater. Yeah. Um, or a human hater. Yes. That's <laughs> uh, true. They, they will find that the issue is not with you trying to talk about a certain issue. The issue is within those people themselves. And the way they project the, this, this ideology onto the world. I and love use this. everything that you yes. have... You know, so, I mean, if I breathe, uh, they can use it. If I don't yeah. breathe, they can use it. Yeah. You know, it's... They're, they're some, looking for, like that for negativity, a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah, but does that mean that you should not talk about certain issues? No. No, because you cannot leave something like an injustice because you are afraid that somebody else will use it against you. You have to be very wary uh, which spaces you talk about certain things, when you talk about certain things, how you talk about certain things, with whom. And if there is something that you have to counter, then you should <coughs> try to counter that. Because I get these questions also from the audience sometimes. Yeah. And I try to take away certain misunderstandings. That's the reason also for this documentary. Like, you have this philosopher called Martin Buber, who was actually a Jewish philosopher who said, um, in Dutch, it's echt leven is echt ontmoeten. To really live is to really, help me out, ontmoeten. Meet one another. Meet one another. It's less beautiful than it's in Dutch. Yeah. But, um, so I think when you meet each other, but also meeting each other through uh, understanding each other's background beyond these superficial ideas that we have about each other, but also meeting yourself through somebody else. Yeah. And that, that is something I think Ooh, that's very like important. It. So you can, have, you can always have people who think things about you, yeah. but you should never stop uh, fighting against injustice. Thank you. Yeah. Fatima, would you oh, like to no, say sorry, something? I just saw someone... Could you come, please? Maybe people have a hearing aid or something and they can't hear you. Um, so what I would like to add, and I think this is very important, this is why this documentary is so uh, striking. So if you leave the floor to the Islamophobes, and they will find things that are true. There are very problematic issues within the Islamic community. The thing is, they have a whole different agenda to it. So the better if you speak out within your communities about certain inequality or injustice or issues even, no matter if they might exist outside the community as well, but you're dealing with it within the community, as to take back the floor. Because all these issues have been hijacked by extremists on all different sides, so I think we should take back the floor to the, to the general public of goodwill. And this is a way to get the debate back to the people of goodwill, like your uncle, who might not agree with you, but he is of goodwill. And that's how you actually connect and encounter and meet up, like, like your, the, the statement you made. So I, I really think we should never be afraid to tackle important issues like these, because there is a major inequality between men and women, especially in uh, the Arab world. You can like it or not, but it's true. And I always, when people will say, but you boost Islamophobia? No, I take back the, audio, I take back the states from the Islamophobes. That's what I get. Thank you so much for your uh, contribution. Thank you. Um, can I just add one yes. thing to that? Yes. There is this, thank you very much for your emphasis. And I do agree that we, you take your voice and you use it without fear of somebody else hijacking it. Because if you don't use it, somebody will hijack it. But you use the Arab world. And I need to talk about that. Because as I said, the Moroccan, yeah, you know what's coming, you know? Brace yourself. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So the Moroccan identity, the Moroccan um, identity is very complex. And I am not an Arab, I'm an Emezir. I'm indigenous, um, North African, African, Emezir, Moroccan. And, and this idea of uh, Arabization has created an issue that is also, that we are seeing now, in Morocco happening, for example, with the Hirak, it's not only an Emezir issue, it's a Moroccan issue, it's an oppression issue, it's an injustice issue. But this idea of that there are people in Morocco that are Arabs, or even that North Africa is Arab, 
is not correct. It's no. an old colonial idea. It's an idea of Arabization. It's an idea of Orientalism. It's a Hegelian racist notion that creates a lot of problems even now here when we are having discussions within certain communities regarding to marginalization. So I also have to speak out about that. And I'm not saying this towards you personally. I'm just throwing it out there into the world. So showing you take knowledge. Yes. These are like we are Amazigh women, and of course we 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 have this this link to. Uh, I'm not saying that th there isn't, but if you really look at uh, how Fatima may identify, how I identify, yeah. how Ibtism, there is this difference, and it's important to to say this because there's also this colonial history where this is very important to know that this idea of this. Uh, uh, Arab people in Morocco has been used also by colonial powers. It's very good to talk about it. It's, it's a whole talk show in itself. It is, it is. It's, but it's something I need to say. But no, it's also, great. Yeah. Just to say that like the documentary was in Nador. Nador is in the Rif. It's in the eastern part of Morocco. Like, Morocco is a big country. There are different parts in Morocco. You will speak to different Moroccans who will tell you different things. Yes. So just to emphasize this complexity and this mosaic of identity. Thank you. But can I just, just yeah. to go we, back uh, We to have this. about uh, two minutes left. Wow. Oh, okay. So, so <laughs> yes, I have to be a little bit strict. So I would like to ask you for final thoughts. So you can add whatever you like. So Fatima, yeah. could you go first, uh, please? I have, I guess, two final thoughts. One yes. that goes, um, yeah, one that uh, follows what Khadija says. Why is it so important to... Um, put emphasis on how this Arab notion of identity is very um, um, uh, oppressive, because it is a male space created in Morocco. Uh -huh. The females in Morocco, like them, let's, let's yes. just talk about Nador. Yeah. You have the male space and then you have the female space. Female, female space is very amazing. And um, this is used as an oppression tool if you go to a public space, it, you have to speak the Arabic language. Yes. And if you're a woman and you can't speak that language because you were like, not uh, accessed, you, you hadn't had access to that space, and thus yes. to that language, you're oppressed just by language. And then you're still a woman, etc., etc. Ah. So that's how it also works. It's a segregating force it's, uh, is what it is. And the second thing is what I wanted to say, what we didn't uh, get into because we only had so little time is um, um, the other part of Moroccan identity that is called Islamic identity. Um, Arab Islam, it's always put together with Arab, Arab Islamic identity. And then there's the Berber, which is the rest or something, yes. or it's pagan and whatever. And it's also, it's always less important. Yeah. Um, and it is important, why I, I want to emphasize this, uh, this is because it, it uh, comes together in the law um, the family law especially, which is uh, telling us how uh, the Arab Islamic identity tells us that women are less, basically, and that's why they inherit less, and that's why. And um, that Arab Islamic identity of ours cannot change. This is what we have seen in the documentary. Yes, yes. Um, it's, um, and it's kind of put against our, um, let's say, social identity or our... Um, uh, local identity, even, and um, this pro um, it's it's, it's a very complex thing. I cannot go into it because no, there's it's no a whole time. other talk but show and documentary <laughs> exactly. itself. Yes, but it's, it's it's very complex. But it it is the basically the core of what we are facing here in the Netherlands. Yes. The, as Moroccan women, we are still also less as women, even though we are Dutch, because we are Moroccan. Ah, thank you so much for your contribution. Kadisha, would you like to add something? Yeah, just to summarize, like, uh, Amazon culture was matriarchal, and you see that this matriarchy is being broken down, and uh, yes. I'm not going to go into it. I just want we to We saw add it in a documentary as yeah. well. It's being broken down. Like, the, the women, like, they had all these people around them. Yeah. And it's different. Right Even now, now, my mom, when she was younger, she tells me that it was different than now, because yes. when we go to, for example, the village, the women are more at home than yes. outside, and they used to spend a lot of time outside. But because I have to give my final thought, I will give my final thought and I want to give you this um, because uh, I have received a lot more than I have given regarding to the people who also worked at the documentary, everybody who I've spoken to. So I want to 
leave this final thought of Fatima Manisi, who was a Moroccan sociologist. She said that you have two conditions for growing wings. The first condition is to feel that you are encircled, and the second condition is to believe that you can break the circle. That's my final thought I want to give. Wow, thank <laughs> you. That's like a present to all of us. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's going to be really difficult to come up with something philosophical right now. It's not the competition. So not, yeah. Yes, competition. after Kadisha, it's really difficult. <laughs> um, no, I just really want to emphasize the fact, as because this is something I've been personally struggling with, and also loads of people I know around me, um, with uh, speaking up against your own society, whatever society that is, whatever community that is, I mean. Um, I recognize both points, but I just really, I'm so done with making excuses for f wanna fight for fucking equality. It's 2018, I'm done. <laughs> I don't want my family or people in my community to tell me I'm a traitor or a fracas de Mohican or whatever, because I want similar rights Preach. to what they, yeah, and I'm just so done with that. But at the same time, that doesn't give food what you say to races, because that's also part of my identity. And that's what's wrong with white feminism. And that's what's wrong with nationalism preaching to be equal and tolerant. What, what's, like what, for example, we hear are not just one identity. And I think that's very important to, yeah, we learned another word, take meta diaspora. So, yeah. ah, and I think it's very important to emphasize that. Yeah. 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 Okay, thank you so much. Like Kadisha, um, or little Mama Alal to us, right? Uh, I think you're a very strong woman, and I think you need to be celebrated you. for your vulnerability oh. and for the amount of success you had with your documentary. So, we have a little, little, little gift for you. Oh. Gifts, I like gifts. Yes. If they are not gifts of criticism, I love them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we go way back. Um, you can see what it is. It's a picture of you printed oh on a, cup cut, uh, a cupcake. It says Kadisha Al Murabit smashing the shit out of patriarchy. <laughs> I designed these, I made these for you because I think you should look back at your success for who you are. And I would like to tell you that you are probably the most humble person that I know. You have gained so much success and, and, and you're not like, oh, I'm successful, I'm Kadisha. She's, other people who are less successful, you bring them to gain success. You believe in their talents, you believe in equality. You're a very hard worker and you also need to be celebrated. So this is for you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to show us a lot more vulnerability right now. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Ibtisan, thank you. Kadisha, thank you. Thank you. Fatima, thank you. thank you very Thanks. much. I would like to thank you all for being here and participating in this evening. I hope you enjoyed yourself. If you have questions or you would like to talk to one another, we're going to have drinks downstairs. Yay! Yes. And this is the first one of the series, Us versus Them. The next one is the 24th of May, and it will be about ooh, Islamophobia, or like Kadisha like to call it, people hate. Uh, it will be about Islamophobia, 24th of May. You can check the calendar at pakhuisenzweiger.nl, Islamophobia Exposed. Uh, you can check the calendar at uh, pakhuisenzweiger.nl or downstairs we have some folders. Thank you very much for your attention. I loved you as an audience. And we should actually have a big applause for our great moderator, Sarita Bainath, everybody. <laughs>